<laughs> why? Uh, I see. Hold on one sec, guys. Sorry. Ah, perfect. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Thomas Nadelhofer. Several of you have been here before, so this is old hat for you. For the rest of you, I'll do a brief introduction to the group, uh, a little bit about how this, the talks are organized, and then I'll I'll turn it over to uh, to Dave. So today it is my pleasure to host a talk by David Shoemaker. The title is "More Moral Torch Fishing: The Functional Theory of Blame." Revisited, clarified, amended, and uh, defended. So um, this is a group that I started, I guess, two years ago. Um, I've hosted a bunch of great talks so far, so this has been a real pleasure for me. Um, it's always nice to, to get to see people I wouldn't otherwise see very often. So that was part of it was just to be able to try to refoster a community that many, many of us lost years ago um, when Garden of Forking Paths closed and then when Flickers of Freedom closed after that. So this was my attempt to kind of reclaim some of that community. Um, I, originally, I was going to host more talks the first year or two. I think I hosted three a semester, but I, I thought it was a bit overkill. I think more people will attend if I keep the number down. So I'm, trying, I'm going to try to do two talks a semester uh, moving forward. Um, I still have a roundtable talk uh, on free will and science that I was supposed to do that I've, I've failed to follow through with. But there are other things that are in the hopper. Um, so you can find out more about the group. We have a, um, there's a homepage, which I can share the link at the end. Um, and then there's also a, uh, a Facebook page. So if you're into that sort of thing, you can find out more about the group, uh, more about the talks there. Uh, in the spring, we have uh, two talks. The dates have yet to be determined. Uh, Helen Stewart is going to be giving a talk and Pamela Hironomy. And you can see a list of all the great speakers that have uh, donated their time uh, in the past. Okay, so during the talk, I'm gonna set it up so you can't unmute yourselves. Um, you'll just have to remind me to make it possible for you to unmute yourselves um, when, uh, when the Q&A comes around. Uh, when the talk ends, if you have a question, please use the hand raise icon. That part's obviously straightforward. This is the part I want you to do though. Try to remember to leave your hand raised until after you and the speaker, you and Dave have had um, the, the, the question back and forth. Um, otherwise, you will move somewhere else and we won't be able to see you. So if in order you to sort of stay in the screen, I want you to make sure you leave your hand raised until after you, your question and the responses are all done. Um, if the speaker, for whatever, if we don't have time uh, for all the questions, if you want me to pass a question along, you can post the questions in the chat and I'll make sure that after the talk, uh, Dave uh, gets a copy. If you would like to be on the email list, that's probably something I should announce on the Facebook group. I'm not really very good about that part. Um, just send me an email and let me know, and I'll be happy to add you to the list. I usually send out a reminder to the, to the people that are on the list, usually a week or so before uh, the talk, and uh, I'll be happy to add you. So, uh, tonight's speaker. So, David Shoemaker, let me move my camera out of my, my video feed of my face. David Shoemaker is a professor in the Sage School of Philosophy at Cornell University. He's written many articles in a book, Responsibility from the Margins, on responsibility. He's the editor of the long-running series, Oxford Studies and Agency and Responsibility, and he's the founder and organizer of the Biennial New Orleans Workshop on Agency and Responsibility, NOAR. His book on humor and morality, uh, Wisecracks, is due out in May 2024 with University of Chicago Press, and his book, The Architecture of Blame and Praise, is under contract with Oxford University Press. So please join me in welcoming our guest, Dave Shoemaker. All right, friend, it's all you. All right, thanks a lot, Thomas. It's, um, and I just, you know, I and many others extend our gratitude to you for what you've done for our community. Um, and so it's a privilege to be here. Uh, I'm, this is, I'm really workshopping this. So this one and only time, first and last time probably that I'll present this, but I'm um, looking to get some feedback from you. It's the kind of talk that I would hate to listen to myself it's where you've got a speaker is giving um dredging up some old view and then just tweaking it a little bit this says there's actually not just tweaking here there's a lot of uh amendment that that um that there's going on here expansion from the previous view that manuel and i put together um and a lot of you know, clarifying things that were not clear in the original project so hopefully it'll be interesting um so 
we start with the uh, torch fisherman from the coral atoll um, in Micronesia called Ifaluk. And um, every year during the trade winds season, they engage in this incredibly elaborate ritual it lasts two or three weeks. They spend a lot of this time at night after the day's work. Uh, and it's just some of the men, not all of the men, uh, weaving these elaborate torches out of coconut fronds and all sorts of things. And then they use those torches for one week uh, at night to catch flying fish, which they then use as bait when they go out deeper to catch a certain kind of dogfish tuna. It's an unbelievably elaborate and time consuming and energy uh, consuming um, uh, ceremony. And it's, uh, it produces a net caloric loss. Uh, the amount of fish that they get or the um, amount of calories that they get from the fish that they catch is actually less than the energy they've expended on the uh, procedure. So why do it? Well, the signaling. Um, signaling to their fellow tribes people that they have an excellent work ethic, that they'll be good providers. And so while it seems to be in the short term uh, quite irrational to do what they're doing, um, that in fact it has long-term benefits that increases the odds of getting into a good marriage and achieving a high community status. So from the paper, the original paper that um, Manuel Vargas and I wrote, it's published a few years ago, uh, our thesis was the blame is essentially this. It's a kind of torch fishing. And it's defined not by any constitutive content, but instead by a costly signaling function. Um, what I want to do today is to expand the critical portion of that project, in particular to question all of the extant constitutivist accounts of blame that are going, explain why the the type of criticism that I'm going to offer motivates a very different method. It's a functionalist approach instead. I want to expand the target of explanation here to a much wider system. So the ultimate target here is not just going to be blame. I'll say more about why I want to expand the system and what the system is. And then to explain in general functionalist approaches uh, to analysis and explanation and to thwart the kinds of objections that Manuel and I have received mostly informally from more constitutivist inclined blame theorists, and then to uh, show why the functionalist account is actually better than its true rivals, which are other functionalist explanations of uh, blame. So that's the, the, the several aims today. Let's get started. Um, when Manuel and I wrote the paper, we really only talked about four views of uh, blame. Um, I'm calling these constitutivist theories. These are simply views that say blame is constituted by, and then they point to some content, typically attitudes of some sort. Um, and I'll say what those are as I go through these. But I want to include all of them um, that people have offered over the last hundred years or so, just to get them all on the table and then to show um, why the functionalist approach is, is a to be preferred. So first is the classic kind of utilitarian inspired influence account of blame, which says that blame is constituted by some kind of influencing expression, which is aimed at either change, changing someone's character or deterring others. Uh, the accounting view of blame says that blame is constituted by some kind of judgment having to do with a stain on someone's soul or um, keeping tabs, moral tabs on people, or it's a negative check mark in their life ledger. This is traced to Michael Zimmerman's kind of groundbreaking work. There's the affective view of blame. It says blame is constituted by some kind of emotions, typically the Strassonian holy trinity of um, uh, resentment, indignation, and guilt. There's relationship view, relationship modification view. So blame on this view is constituted by some kind of judgment of an impairment of a relationship and a modification of that relationship that's appropriate to the particular impairment. Um, a communicative view says that blame is constituted by some kind of moral demand typically that's being communicated um, where What's demanded is some kind of acknowledgement or apology or uptake of some sort. Protest view is probably the most popular view amongst the kids these days. Uh, so blame is constituted by some kind of protest um, where 
it's in the constitutive version, some kind of protesting attitude or expression. Um, and then there's the minimal theories uh, that George Scher has offered and uh, Brink and Nelkin and Doug Fortmore has a kind of minimalist theory, according to which um, there are lots of things built on top of some crucial core component that all cases of blame share. Uh, so for George Scher, it's a kind of belief, uh, desire component that I believe that you did something wrong and I desire that you not have done it. Um, or some kind of aversive attitude at its core. So these are the going theories of blame. We're all pretty familiar with these. Um, and so what Manuel and I did was offer what we took to be prima facie counterexamples to each of these theories of blame. Now it's very important to be quite clear about what's going on in the offering of these counterexamples. They are importantly prima facie counterexamples, um, that they are on their face counterexamples that seem to obviously cut against the uh, constitutive component that's being offered up. None of these theorists are incapable of responding to these prima facie counterexamples, but what they motivate, and this is the language that Manuel and I used and lots of people hated, but it motivates a kind of, it requires a kind of fancy dancing to respond to the counterexamples, where all that means is that um, the counterexamples on their face tend to cut against the constitutive component and so in order to patch up the theory, you have to offer ways of adding to the theory that mostly seem to contravene the spirit of the original proposal, the constitutivist proposal. And so we're not, not denying that people can't respond here. What we're, what we're doing is saying that there's something about the, uh, the counterexamples in each case and, and what they motivate and the way in which it, the, the responses seem to contravene the spirit of the whole enterprise that for us uh, called for a, a, a very new approach. So I'll just go quickly through the kinds of counterexamples many of you are familiar with. On its face, the influence account that says blame is constituted by some expressive, um, uh, well, some kind of influencing expression, it runs into the obvious counterexample of cases of private blame. Um, George, this is George Schur's uh, criticism. In order to influence, it has to be genuinely sincere, it has to really reflect some attitude of disapproval that you've got, otherwise it's easily seen through. But then if that's the case, what's doing, what has to be doing the work, what counts as uh, blame in this case is gonna be the attitude itself and not necessarily the expression. For the accounting view, uh, blamers aren't often viewing the blamed as you know, soiled, that they have a soul that's been stained or we don't think that we're running moral tabs on each other. And if you're a long-term relationship and somebody is, you know, the, the, your partner has wronged you in some minor way, it's not like you say, aha, I'm gonna add that to the tab. Um, and the mere judgment aspect of the accounting view seems to, uh, fails to capture the kind of emotional or thinging element that is, we think, um, most often uh, accompanies this uh, most often accompanies blame. I, I take the sting uh, phrase from uh, Pamela Hieronymi, and I and I I like it, and I think it's quite important. Um, so the affective views they run into obvious difficulty from cases of non-emotional blame. I mean, you know, this the downcast eyes or the shaking head of my mother uh, certainly counts as blame, despite the fact that there's no emotion involved. Um, this was in part what motivated Scanlon's relationship modification view that sometimes I can, you know, if you're just a jerk to me online, I can unfriend you on Facebook. That's, that's not a Scanlon example. That's an Angie Smith example. Um, but I can do so without any kind of emotional response, but nevertheless, that action seems like I'm blaming you. And there are, of course, cases of angry non-blame and Manuel and I talked about these where you can have cases of resentment or indignation, resenting your infirmities or you're indignant at the indignities of life uh, that don't constitute blame. So these are, again, prima facie um, false positives and prima facie false negatives. Uh, the relationship modification view has plenty of, uh, of these prima facie counterexamples. So there's the famous Susan Wolf case of blame Italian style where you've got these loving families 
that just yell like crazy at one another in blaming one another. Why did you take, why did you go in my closet again and take my clothes? Uh, but nothing about the relationship is modified. Cases of self-blame, it's hard to make sense of um, a relationship modification view is applied to self-blame. How is it that I'm modifying some relation to myself? Uh, it, it, again, it's just hard to make sense of that, blaming the dead. Um, and then Angie Smith's uh, mother case, so there's a case in which, and this is the case that she offers as, explicitly as a counterexample to Scanlon's relationship modification view, that a mother um, judges that her son has done something terrible and so has done something that impairs various relationships, and she modifies her own relationship to him in a way that makes it more loving. She's, she's, she wants to love him more in order to be his rock when she knows that people will come after him uh, and blame him. But so it meets the um, components of uh, Scanlon's constitutivist view, but it is not blame. Uh, the communicative accounts, uh, they run into the obvious uh, prima facie counterexample of private blame. If what uh, blame is constituted by is the communication of a moral demand, then how can we make sense of this? Self blame as well. Uh, what's there to communicate to myself if I already know what uh, the communicator, which is me, is attempting to communicate to me? Again, hard to make sense of self-blame. Uh, blaming the dead, of course, is a problem. Uh, no one there to whom you can communicate anything. And in cases in which you communicate the moral demand, so these are cases of false positives, you communicate the demand uh, to someone, I won't stand for that. Uh, we don't stand for that kind of abuse or that way of being talked to where it's not blame, um, but it's absolutely the communication of the, the moral demand in a assertive way. Protest view, again, uh, runs into the worries about private blame, um, given the protest seems quite on its face to be public. Again, self-blame. How do we make sense of my protesting to myself I'm both the protester and the protestee, uh, blaming the dead. And the false positive of uh, Sister Helen Prejean standing in front of the prison as they're about to execute someone and she's uh, protesting the death penalty, uh, holding up a candle, say, but uh, not blaming. And in the middle, the minimal view, uh, which is just to say that there's some core constitutive component of blame that's attitudinal. Uh, runs into a uh, case uh, raised by um, a review of George Scher's book, um, Vatican, I, I think, I'm, I'm not sure I got the name right, and McKenna. Um, and the idea is on Scher's view, blame consists in this belief, desire component. I believe that you did something wrong and I desire that you not have done it. And so the case is this, suppose that you and I are sitting at a dinner table and we see this notorious fellow come in and uh, who's typically doing blameworthy things. And um, you say, uh, I bet you 20 bucks he's gonna do something blameworthy tonight at dinner. And I say, nope, I don't think he will tonight. And then sure enough, we see the guy steal a tip off of the other table. And so he did something blameworthy and I lost the bet. So I believe that he did something blameworthy. I desire that he not have done the thing in question. He not have done, not have done the blameworthy thing, but it's not a case of blame. Now, these minimalist views, they can fix their views to respond to this kind of case where uh, um, the attitude is, um, or the blame more than it's kind of instrumental in a way, uh, by making it that uh, the responders are committed in some important way to uh, upholding the norm that was violated in this particular case. And so that's the source of the attitude is their commitment to that uh, norm and the upholding of that norm. But once you make those moves, you're actually moving closer to a more functionalist view. Uh, I just wanna note that right now. Other problems that are had by the Brink and Nelkin view and other minimalist views is that there seem to be plenty of false positives. So cases of aversive attitudinal responses to some kind of wrongdoing, culpable wrongdoing, that nevertheless, I think have a hard time fitting into counting as blame. So 
like disgust or horror. I mean, if I see people who are blatantly engaged in culpable wrongdoing, say, you know, um, pursuing an insurrection and overrunning the Capitol or um, uh, lying about <laughs> various election results, um, there's a kind of terror or fear that I think is the appropriate response to people like this who, who could so blatantly violate these kinds of norms and they're culpable in so doing. But I don't think these things easily fit as blame responses. They don't easily count as blame responses. And then there are false negatives. My favorite case is, and this, this is a case that Manuel and I did talk about, is uh, what I'm calling now counterfactual blame. And it comes from the movie Force Majeure in which a uh, like perfect couple and their perfect children are at this Swiss chalet uh, and they're up on this uh, beautiful uh, balcony eating dinner and there's a controlled avalanche that's coming their way. They don't know it's controlled. It gets closer and closer. And all of a sudden the husband just completely shoves away his wife and children and abandons them, just runs like hell to get away from the scene. And then the avalanche stops because it was controlled. And um, as the snow dust st settles, you see the mother hunched over her two children trying to protect them. And then the husband comes sauntering back in as if nothing happened and says, eh, wow, oh, I guess it was controlled after all. And this is just the beginning of the dissolution of their marriage. The point here is that they have a young couple that comes to visit them, friends of theirs. And um, the guy's wife tells them this story of what he did in running away and abandoning, abandoning his family. And then the young couple, they go back to their own hotel room and the woman slaps the guy or slap, hits him on the shoulder and says, that's something you would do. Now, this is blame, I think, but it's not for any culpable wrongdoing because they didn't do any. And people who are in close romantic relations, relationships, I think, find this kind of uh, phenomenon familiar, um, where I don't think the blame here is attached to his character, even though the character might be the source of the thing that he would do. Um, so it's a really interesting case. And I think we engage in this kind of thing quite a bit, but it, it can't easily be handled by the minimal view. And then finally, there are cases in which, say, a chess coach um, has just been counseling his pupil over and over again, don't fall into this particular sort of trap, and then is watching uh, the pupil play it in a chess match and falls into that exact trap and is just blaming him. Um, but it doesn't seem like there's culpable wrongdoing in this kind of case, or at least to the because these minimal views are really concerned with moral wrongdoing almost exclusively. Uh, or cases of hurt feelings in which I hurt your feelings by telling you a hard truth. You know, I, 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 I think I've fallen out of love with you. Or if maybe you gave me a gift and I didn't have any room for it and it was, wasn't, very, wasn't a very good gift, so I throw it away and you drive by one day and you see it in the garbage, you're hurt. your feelings are gonna be hurt even though I was completely justified. Uh, and I might be moved to apologize. And so it seems like your response to me is a blaming kind of response. And my response suggests that uh, the blame might have been apt in some way. Uh, or cases in which there's a, uh, say on our 20, 20th anniversary, I go out and buy my wife uh, some cheap carnations at the local grocery store. Um, she, I think, can aptly blame me in that case, despite the fact that I didn't engage in any culpable wrongdoing and giving her a gift. I wish she would understand that finally. But no, I haven't done anything like that. Um, so these are not responses to blameworthy violations of legitimate demands, I think. So in each case, there are these prima facie counterexamples and to respond to them, to patch up the theory, very often, and I'm not gonna go through this, but we'll go, we'll, um, as I said earlier, contravene the kind of spirit that motivated the original component offering in the first place. So one might then say, well, why don't we just go with a disjunctive theory? So this would still be a kind of constitutivist view. It's just, you got a long list of disjuncts. So it, um, um, something counts as blame um, just to the extent that it's one of these things. So it's a reactive attitude or it's a relationship modification or it's protest or it's communicated, blah, 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 blah. And you just list all the ones that we just went through. Maybe there are others. So I've got the ellipses at the end. Maybe there are others that you wanna to add to the list. Um, and then say, if something counts as blame, it's gonna have one of these things. So at least one of these things is necessary. And maybe all together, they're for sure sufficient to count 
as blame. Maybe there's some subset that will also be sufficient to count as blame. I think something like this is right. I think this is, in fact, a kind of correct constitutive, constitutivist view if you want one. But the problem now is I've lost interest. Uh, I don't. I, I'm no longer. I'm no longer, no longer really care too much about this. And the reason is that I don't. Now it seems like I need to get an answer to a different question, which is why are these properties on the list and not others? What is the unifying explanation for why these things are on the list and not other kinds of things? And so, to ask for a theory of blame that just gives you this list of disjunctive properties kind of is very deflating. And so it presses the need to maybe make a very different, offer a very different approach. And yes, this is Olivia Newton-John. Let's get functional. All right. In some contexts, and in response to some things, our blaming responses are sometimes influencing expressions, reactive attitudes, relationship modification, et cetera, et cetera, all the things on the disjunctive list. But what we've got here, and the phenomenon that we want to focus on, is in fact a collection of agential responses that is a recognizably organized and stable social system. Right? It's a thoroughgoing part of our interpersonal lives. We are intimately familiar with it, and we can recognize it when it when it when it happens. So. If that's what we've got on our hands, we've got available to us a set of tools that comes from uh, work in biology and psychology and social science. And what they say is, okay, if we've got an organized system, if we wanna understand the nature of it, then we have to switch our focus from what makes various properties members of that system to these functional analyses and explanations of those systems. And instead of asking what makes some response count as blame, Instead, we need to ask the question, what's all this blame for? Now, it's crucial here that we get a precise target in mind. What's the actual social system here? Now, to this point, I've only been talking about blame. But I think that the actual system here is much more inclusive. It's a system of blame and praise. So we not only respond negatively, but we also respond positively to various agential targets. And what's crucial is that these responses, these positive responses are actually continuous with blame. They are recognizably part of the same general response pool. And the positive responses, the praising responses also exhibit the various constitutivist features. That sometimes blame is relationship modifying towards someone, getting closer to someone. Sometimes it's an emotional expression. Sometimes it's an influencing expression, as with our children. Sometimes it's, uh, what are the others? Uh, uh, communicative, you're communicating some kind of moral demand. And sometimes it's just this minimal or attitudinal component. In fact, I did a day of research at the hallowed halls of Facebook University and asked a bunch of my friends, what do you think are the kinds of responses that you would you would include on a list of blame and praise. And these are the ones that we came up with. There's a lot, I'm not gonna go through all of these. They range from the blamey to the praisey. There's quite a bit here. And what's really important, some of these are fringe, some of these you're gonna say, maybe they're on the edge, maybe they count, maybe they don't. Um, many of them are quite central to it though. And what matters here is that there's a pool of agential responses, again, ranging from the blamey to the praisey, that we can easily recognize as part of a system of agential responses, it's stable, organized. And so as a social system, we wanna ask the functionalist question. Just to say a bit more about why I wanna include praise here. Um, for one thing, we have a kind of uncertainty or disagreement and sometimes about how to respond to people. Could be positive, could be negative. So here's an athletic case. So suppose that on your favorite team, the best player, um, at the towards the end of the game prevents the opposing team's player from getting a dunk that would really, you know, spark uh, um, and motivate the other team. Um, and so does it with a really hard foul and he fouls out as a result of this. Well, he might think, as the coach might think, uh, on the one hand, I blame him. He's fouled out. He's our best player. He's not going to be able to contribute anymore. On the other hand, I praise him because um, that really did undercut what would have been a 
a motiv motivating kind of play. And so I praise him for doing what it took uh, courageously to uh, prevent the other team from increasing its mojo. So, you know, we go back and forth here. I have praising responses, but I have blaming responses, maybe in intrapersonally, but also, of course, interpersonally. But what matters is we recognize that these are both the same kinds of responses. That is to say, they are agential responses that are part of the same pool. And, you know, we could, we could go with one or the other. They might think, well, these are athletic cases. It doesn't really count as blame. I think that view is false. But uh, we do this in moral cases, too. I mean, suppose that I decide that I'm going to uh, sanction cheaters in my class by forcing them to wear a scarlet C if they're caught cheating and they got to stand in front of the classroom for the next two weeks. Um, some might praise me for something that's going to be incredibly, work incredibly well as a deterrent to other cheaters. And some might think, oh, this is horrifying. It, it's the worst exhibit of toxic rigor uh, that you could find. But anyway, it's the same kind of thought here that there can be uncertainty and there can be disagreement, but we recognize that we're disagreeing about the same pool of possible agential responses. So the question then, okay, so that's gotta be our focus. And this is a big amendment, a big change from the original moral torch fishing uh, view where we were just focused on blame. Although we left it open that the same treatment might apply to praise. So I don't think anything I say here is gonna contradict what Manuel and I wrote, but it does expand it, I think in helpful um, clarifying ways. So we've got this system, blame and praise. What's the system for? When you're offering functional explanations in science and evolutionary theory in particular, what you wanna do is identify the causal contribution of some organized system. So for example, if you wanna understand the circulatory system or give a functional account of that, um, you have to understand its contribution to the, to some organized system, uh, sorry, of that organized system to some goal of the organism. And in these evolutionary biological functional explanations, it's often put in terms of evolutionary fit, fitness. So what's the heart for? Well, it's for pumping blood and it's what enables our ancestors to survive and reproduce. And it's what enables us to survive and reproduce. Functional explanations are also really important in social science. And so economics and consumer behavior research. Um, here, the functional explanations are very, are, are analogous, I think. They often articulate some causal contribution of a social system to an organism, society. Uh, so the survival and thriving of society. These responses of the blame and praise system, I think are all appraisals of creatures performances relative to some standards. These are creatures in particular who are capable of violating standards, but they're also capable of ignoring them or adhering to them or superseding them. That is, these are agents and the, and the standards against which they are praised are normative for them or just norms. So these are norm recognizing agents who are also capable, capable of responding both to the norms and to blame or praise. And they can respond to blame or praise in many, many, many ways. So it can be educative or informative, or it can be resented. It can be gratifying, be rejected. It can be embraced. And of course, it can be action guiding. So what's the function of the system? This too is a difference from the original paper that Manuel and I wrote. I think it's much more uh, clearly put as norm maintenance. That's what all this blame and praise is for. It's for norm maintenance, where the norms are regulative, interpersonal, or intrapersonal demands, but not just demands, as many people have thought, also expectations or hopes or ideals to which the responder is committed. And by being committed to a norm, I just simply mean for it to provide some reason or motivational pull within the framework of one's deliberations, attitudes, ends, or actions. So I can be committed to a norm where, of course, I've internalized it and so forth. Uh, that's one way. But another way is um, to be uh, committed to a norm in the kind of beakiary sense, where I just think if I violate some norm, lots of people are going to come after me or cancel me or yell at me or something. So I just want to avoid that stuff. To the extent that that norm then plays a deliberative role for me, it still counts as something to which I'm committed. Okay, 
So that's the first part of, a fu of the functionalist explanation. The function of the blame praise system is norm maintenance. The second part of a robust functionalist explanation articulates why it makes sense to contribute to the system. So why it makes sense um, for the heart to contribute to the system or makes, makes sense for the sperm to travel in this direction. Um, but also in this case, given the significant costs. So we participate in the blame praise system. Why do we do so? Given that it has all these costs where the costliness importantly is about hard to fakedness. Say more about that. The costs risked by blame, many of them are obvious and familiar. It's emotionally taxing. It expends a lot of energy to get angry at somebody. It, of course, and my colleague George Paraboom has made a lot of this, it risks backfire. Um, if you're wagging your finger at somebody who's not wearing a mask in a grocery store early on in a pandemic, you might get shot. You keep getting angry at your partner, it's gonna corrode the relationship. And you yourself risk blame for incorrect or dishonest blaming. So just take the latter, you're just kind of virtue signaling um, your blame. You get blamed in return. People could see through that pretty easily, but also if you're blaming the wrong person or blaming somebody who uh, has a good excuse and you're ignoring that excuse or somebody who's exempt, then you risk yourself being blamed. So there's lots of costs risk by blame. What I want to talk about today, though, and, and, and try to impress on your other costs, also risk by praise. So praise typically involves some kind of emotional expenditure. This, too, is the expenditure of energy. It risks interpersonal backfire for reasons of comparative unfairness or cases in which you're disproportionately praising someone who um, it's fitting to praise them less. Uh, so if you've got two children and you're praising only one of them, even though both of them are doing exactly the same good things, um, there's kind of unfairness there, which risks backfire and then put, move that to the adult world and it can get worse, the responses. And, uh, Emily Benjamin and others have been talking about how praise can reinforce toxic norms. So uh, praising men for child care, for the kind of minimal child care that they're doing, I think it's called the daddy dividend. Um, for the exact same things that women do that people don't praise them for, tends to reinforce toxic gender norms. Um, praising a trans woman for looking so much like a real woman. This is the kind of thing that's just kind of horrifying. Um, and that would uh, tend towards the reinforcement of these toxic gender norms. So there are these important risks that are the costly risks of praise. There also is blowback for incorrect or dishonest praising. Um, you're praising the wrong people. The person who was the right person and uh, offer a blowback to that, or uh, your virtue signaling your praise for someone where you, people can easily see through this, uh, you risk blowback, you risk being blamed for your praise in that case. And the etiology of narcissism turns out to be uh, mostly a certain parenting style, which involves a praise of children, where the praise is um, taken characterologically as opposed to behaviorally. So if you're praising children and saying, uh, you are such a great child, you are so much better than those other kids, you know, in your class, I, I think you're the best student, blah, blah, blah. This is the sort of thing that students, intern I mean, students, <laughs> that kids will internalize and um, it creates little narcissists out of them and narcissists are horrible people. Okay, so I've been talking about the costliness of both blame and praise. I think it's very important to recognize the costs of praise and important to recognize two kinds of costs here. Now, costly signaling theory is used in both um, uh, evolutionary biology explanations and also economics, consumer, consumer behavioral research, social science domains. I think they each appeal to two subtly different kinds of costs. I'm not sure that this has been sufficiently noticed before. On the one hand, there is the peacock cost, which is the cost in having or sending the signal. 
So think of this as signaling costs. It just, it, that tail weighs a lot. <laughs> and to have it drag around all day, I mean, it signals your fitness and fig- signals your strength, but it, it's a drain to have that signal. That's the emphasized cost in these biological costly signaling theories. But it turns out that what the cost is for the social science costly signaling theorists, it's a different location. It's in coming to have that signal. So think of these as competence costs or acquisition costs. Uh, Many people will point to handing a potential employer your CV. What's going on there? Well, you're signaling. That's what that's the explanation. And you're signaling your uh, um, that you'd be good at the job. But of course, handing a CV or even you know, just sending it on email isn't costly in and of itself at all. Um, so it's not like the peacock's tail. Instead, the cost comes from all the time and energy that you had to put into getting the qualifications that are listed on that CV, going to that school, spending all that time studying. Um, the work experience you've got, being really good at your job and forging uh, various, uh, forming various social connections and so forth. These are the kinds of things that employers want to know about from you. And that's what you're signaling and handing your CV. But all the costs are, they come up front. They come in coming to have that signal. I mean, the CV itself is an honest reflection. I mean, it's easy to check. And so um, uh, you can check all these factors about people. Um, okay. So this will play, this plays a crucial role for me. So both kinds of costs apply to the blame praise system. Now I've been talking in about the costs risked by both blame and praise. These are costs risked by having or sending the signal. They're the kind of peacock costs. What kind of costs are involved in acquisition and competence? Well, my God, there's tons. You have to, you have to know what the norms are that you're going to be maintaining in engaging in your blame and praise. And so you have to be a good blamer and praiser. And this takes a long time. It's very difficult. There are lots of costs, time and energy that are spent in becoming a good blamer and praiser. Again, you have to know what the norms are. You have to keep up with what the norms are, what a violation is, what excuses are appropriate. Um, But also you have to keep up with the norms of blaming and praising. There are various ways in which you might do that, uh, good and bad. You might be disproportionate in your blame and praise. And it might be that you only blame. So good old Bobby Knight only blamed his players. He was a basketball coach. That's all he did was criticize and blame. He never praised them. That's a bad, that's an incompetent member of the uh, blame praise system. Um, this very famous professor uh, whose course I once sat in on when I was visiting uh, at that university. And, but, and so students would write these discussion questions and in response to every single one, this professor would say, oh my God, that's such a great question. Well, I mean, grad students can see through that. They know which ones were good and which ones were not so good. And so it disincentivized the better students from spending that much time on their question, given that, given that everybody was being praised equally. Well, this was, this was a person who was uh, impaired when it came to the blame and praise system, because sometimes to be a, a competent member, you need to dish out some blame as well, or at least withhold some praise. So you've got these serious costs. You've got the signaling costs, the peacock costs, and you've got the competence costs. And there are lots here. And they make it being a competent member very hard to fake. Why do it? Well, the answer comes from costly signaling theory. I'll go through this fairly quickly, developed by Mouse and Feblin where information is valuable. This costly signaling was about information. So where information is valuable, a costly signal could arise and become part of a stable biological or social system when the following conditions are in place. So when some members of a group have a quality that's difficult to perceive directly, but to which a reliable signal could attach. So your fitness and strength for the peacock, your qualities for the job, for the job applicant. These are difficult to perceive directly. I can't read it off your forehead but there could be a signal that could deliver that information reliably. Then if also there are some members who are the observers um, who would stand to gain from gleaning accurate information about that quality. So the people who are hiring, they would really stand to gain if they know who the best employees would be. 
where the signalers and the observers have a conflict of interest so that signalers who are able to deceive observers about the quality would actually be benefited and the observers at the observer's expense. And then the cost of the signal has to have some benefit to the signal. And that's exactly what's going on, I think, in the blame praise system. When a costly signal becomes part of some stable system, it's gonna be one in which it has observers, it's hard to fake. Otherwise anybody could imitate it and get the goods. It delivers accurate information to the observers and it benefits the signaler. And as I say, this is just how blame and praise work, I think, in our interpersonal practices. So why is it rational to signal then? Well, I'm conveying to you in a hard to fake way, and this is whether I do so knowingly or deliberately, it's very rare that we're actually thinking of the signals that we're emitting when we're blaming or praising someone. But I am nevertheless conveying information about the norms to which I'm committed, the practical reasons that I take seriously, what steps I'm willing to take to police these things. And this is incredibly valuable information. It reveals the blamer or the praiser's trustworthiness, their cooperative dispositions, uh, the kinds of things that they like, the things that they value, and much more. And this, this is the kind of information you can organize your life around. And this is information that's normally impossible to gather and the system works because of its costs. Okay, so some quick objections that might be offered on the part of constitutivists. What about the blame or praise without costs? Like, you know, my best friend, I just snippily chide him for some minor failure or my neighbor mows his lawn at 5 a.m. Uh, and I just refuse to greet him, my ordinarily friendly greeting in Scanlon's words. I'm online, I'm anonymous, anonymously criticizing some celebrity or I'm blaming the downtrodden from some privileged heights. There are no costs, it seems, in these cases. Well, there are, there are lots of competence costs. They're absolutely still in place. Uh, you've come to be a competent signaler um, and that took a lot of effort and expenditure of energy. But also signaling costs are about information that's hard to fake and that still applies in these kinds of cases. There are other responses here, but I'll just go on. What about private blame or praise? Well, that's a predictable upshot of norm commitment that you're gonna emit signals. You in fact emit signals all the time, even when you think you're holding, keeping it to yourself, face gets flushed, clenched jaw. This is an important distinction between the signaling theory and communicative theories. Uh, signaling is not communicating, um, where the aim is uptake. Signaling is just the emission of information, whether or not I have any control over that. And of course, signals can be blocked. I can choke back my anger, I can swallow my pride at my daughter who's like kicking ass on the softball field or the soccer field. I, I, I hold it back so that I don't make others feel bad, but that's really hard. And it's something that you have to do quite deliberately and people are just bad at it. Um, there are of course cases of dispassionate blame. You can signal your commitment to various kinds of norms dispassionately, just with a, or a little thumbs up or a thumbs down from the coach. Cases of self-blame are easily handled. Tom Brady throwing another interception, he's clearly blaming himself. We can read that signal very, very easily. And it reveals that he's committed to certain standards of excellence. Counterfactual blame case, uh, the signaling uh, can handle quite easily, I think. I mean, what's going on is you know, when she says, that's something you would do, clearly signaling. She's conveying information about her commitment to and willingness to enforce certain norms of the relationship, which are seen as possibly threatened, given her assessment of his character. Again, she's not blaming his character. And, and this is revealed also in case of counterfactual praise. So suppose you're with, uh, you're the coach watching with a player, a basketball player of yours, you're watching another team in action. They have a great player and that great player makes a great play and you kind of nudge your, play, your own player and say, man, that's something that you would do in a praisey way, it's kind of counterfactual praise. Again, you're signaling your commitment to various norms of athletic excellence. Okay, so just a quick summary here and then a very quick <laughs> final set of remarks. The system's overall function here is norm maintenance. I, we'd originally put it as costly signaling. I think that's, um, that's, a, that's how it's achieved via, uh, uh, or the, the, sorry, that this general system is a costly signaling system, but the overall function of the blame praise system is norm maintenance. 
It's achieved via this stable and trustworthy information exchange. The costliness here of the signal sometimes comes from the signaling, but it comes more fundamentally from the sacrifices it takes to come to have a reliable and trustworthy signal so that one's blame and praise are recognized as honest reflections of your valuable traits. That's how you get the goodies. The costs of emitting and coming to have that signal can be outweighed by a variety of benefits that's doled out by those who recognize, act on, and trust in the accurate information it conveys. So that explains why it makes sense to participate and to participate well in the system. The costs of coming to have the good signal are worth it. Okay, very quickly, uh, sorry, I'm running a little long here. Um, I just wanna go through um, the true competitors to this functionalist plus costly signaling theory account are um, protest theories that are truly functionalist. Uh, so these would be one in which uh, the kinds of responses that people have count, are they're, they're part of the blame phrase system in virtue of the fact that they constitute a kind of, pro, they have a kind of protesting function. Others would say that no, the, the function is an affective, plays it, it's affective, plays an affect, affective role. I'll explain what that's gonna look like in a second. And then the third would be a communicative functionalist view. So the first would be a protest view. There's ways to read Angie's work that it is a functionalist account. Um, some replies. It's, so this is a rival functionalist account. And so now we have to tot up uh, how well it does at explaining various aspects of the system. One worry here is um, how does the protest view reply to the entire system? How is protest to reply to the entire system of blame and praise? I mean, how are we to think of the positive analog of protest, a kind of touting or embracing, maybe honoring? It could be right, but then those don't overlap much with a lot of the rest of our system of praise. So it's things like gratitude um, or just simple compliments. That was a nice job. That was a nice philosophy talk one might say. Um, the typical ways to construe the target of protest by the actual protest theorists is that you're responding to someone's poor quality of will and until they apologize or withdraw it, it constitutes a threat to you. What's the positive analog here for the protest theorists? I, I'm not sure. It, it's hard to say what that would be. Um, and then the cases of counterfactual blame, it has a harder time with the sister Helen case where she's protesting but not blaming, where we protest our children's homework mistakes, um, where we correct, no, that's not the way you do that particular math problem. So there are questions here that I wanna raise and these are the kinds of things that you wanna pursue. The affective view um, that is embraced by uh, Sean Nichols and Tori McGeer, the emphasis is on moral anger, it doesn't have to be present in every case of blame, Tori is very clear about that, but you've got a moral anger system and the function of it is likely to secure social norms, including conventions of cooperation. So moral anger and its punitive expressions, they work to discourage cheating, defection, and violations of reciprocity, and they solve problems in the social domain. So that's the, just a very brief way to explicate the affective functionalist view. Just some quick responses here. Okay, but then I'm not sure how to account for the entire system of blame and praise. What's the affective core of praise? Um, in the face of say, a mere compliment or encouragement. And how does that affective core contribute to the function here that's been articulated? So these, again, these are just questions to ask where I think that my version of the functionalist view has a better story to tell. And then what do we say about case of non-moral blame? So you blame people for their culinary failures. You make me a terrible meal or prudential failures. Uh, I, bet it all, I bet all my retirement money on, on uh, black or I, as in uh, lost in America, I lost the nest egg uh, or something like aesthetic blame. Here, what's being aimed at are mostly performance standards, failures to live up to various kinds of performance standards and not at securing social cooperation at least directly, so, but a story needs to be told there. I think that the, my norm maintenance view um, with the costly signaling stuff can do so pretty easily. And then finally, the communicative view, 
uh, Miranda Fricker and Colleen McNamara. Um, it does purport to apply to emotional blame and praise. It's communicating a kind of moral upset and it's for eliciting uptake. Those are, that's the phrase that McNamara uses or a demand for acknowledgement. That's the phrase that Fricker likes. But it really is still unclear how it would apply to the entire system of moral blame or praise. Um, there are aspects of it that are dispassionate, that are life ledger blame, that are just ticks in people's moral tabs, uh, mere eye rolls and so forth, behind your back kind of eye rolls. So it's just not entirely clear how it would, even though it purports to apply to the entire system, how it would in fact apply. In economic games, like the trust game, the ultimatum game, so forth, people will sanction one another where they know for a fact it's not gonna be communicated. It's not meant to be communicated. It's merely targeting kind of behavioral outcome. People take these sanctions to be blame. So it's not, not clear how this communicative functionalist account is going to account for those cases. And of course, then cases of non-moral blame or praise, I'm not communicating some kind of moral upset aimed at eliciting uptake or demanding acknowledgement when I you know, say that was a terrible meal or um, I can't believe you put that huge red swath in the middle of your delicate watercolor and it's kind of aesthetic blame and so forth. Okay, so finally, I'll just wrap up. The norm maintenance plus costly signaling theory, functionalist explanation of the blame praise system explains why various agential responses are in the system when they are and why they aren't when they aren't. So as a functionalist explanation, it's not vulnerable to the kinds of objections that constitutivist views are typically vulnerable. The attempts to provide, you know, say, to give the kinds of counter kind of kind of ah, kinds of counter examples I was offering against them, it's not a kind of response you can give to the functionalist view. Um, and then when it comes to the functionalist rivals, this view has, I think, my view has greater explanatory power. Although I haven't spent much time saying why a few brief remarks, but it has the singular advantage at the end of the day, I think of being true and wise. All right, thanks everybody. Looking forward to your questions. All right, I see some hands. Better put my own hand in the queue or I'll never, I'll never get to ask my own question. Hold on one sec. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, Greg's hand is the first in my screen, so let's start with him. Oh, okay. Hey, Dave. Um, that was great hey, talk. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll try to keep this really short. So here's three really quick questions. Um, is your system neutral about the role of dessert, um, whether it's basic or non-basic? Um, in the functional system of, of a gentle responses. It seems to me that it is. Um, I would take that to sort of be an advantage. Um, but if it's not, I'm kind of curious how that functional, how dessert plays into that functional nature. The second is I'm not sure I'm, I'm on board with this. And the end of your talk, you kind of correct for this, but this very strong distinction between the constitutive views and the functional views it seemed to me that many of those initial views can be construed as functional views. And there's one functional view that you didn't mention, um, which were, I would take the influence view. I kind of consider myself an influence protest hybrid kind of view. And I would view it as a kind of a functional view, but where the moral protest in the case of blame or the equivalent in the case of praise is forward looking. So therefore I consider, I, I guess you consider that influential view. So David Pirgum and, and you know, forward looking account and moral responsibility. Um, I could, I don't see why that has to be viewed as a purely constitutive view and why there can't be an, a functional equivalent to that kind of view. And it would also get, and the influence view would get rid of that asymmetric criticism you had against just the purely protest view. Uh, where it seemed to apply to play, pr a blame and not praise. And then very lastly, um, it, it it doesn't seem to me like the, the, the kind of costly signaling account avoids the fancy dancing that you want to accuse, you, you accuse the constitutive views of. It seems to me that when you get into, say, responding to private blame, it seems that you are criticizing the constitutive views for fancy dancing 
um, when they respond in a, what might be equivalent way that you respond, which is in your response on the functional account, well, this is kind of norm reinforcement. Even if you don't express it, it still has this kind of functional role in policing norms, perhaps, even if they're just internal. Um, I don't see why like the influence, a functional influence view can't say the same thing. And so like, you know, even if I don't, you know, uh, overtly blame or protest, um, you know, a wrong, it could be that I'm internally generating kinds of behaviors that then are aimed at forward-looking benefits like reconciliation, moral formation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those, just to restate the, the three view, the questions, like, is there dessert play a role? Non or non-basic or basic? Is there really this hard and fast distinction between constitutive and functional accounts? Why can't there be a kind of forward-looking functional account? And why would it be guilt guilty of fancy dancing when your responses to the objections seem just as fancy and just as light on their feet? Great. So the answers are no, yes, and predictable upshot. Thank you. Next. No. <laughs> I think I got that. <laughs> so I, I think that um, actually it's yes and no. So the, the uh, it is neutral with respect to dessert, but I think there's a crucial backward looking element in um, our interpersonal practices of blame. There's tons of it. Um, this goes to the second point as well, that yes, there is some, there are some aspects of expressions that are influential. And they are forward looking, but there's a lot of backward looking stuff too. The question is whether or not you have to explain the backward looking, looking stuff in terms of dessert, or can you do it all in terms of fit? And so my talk two weeks ago at No War was, and you've seen this, you can do it all in terms of fit, I think. But those are looking at the fitness conditions of what's going on within the system. And so yes, as a system, it in and of itself, it's perfectly neutral with respect to uh, des the dessert uh, question. Um, is there a real difference between the constitutivist and the functionalist account? Yeah, I think, I mean, they're answering different questions. Uh, the constitutivist is saying, what is blame constituted by? And the functionalist is saying, I'm not interested in that. We've got a recognizable system here of blame and praise. What's it for? And so that means that the functionalist view is not vulnerable to the same kinds of counterexampling that the constitutivist view is. I mean, there's a sense in which there's counterexampling, which would be to say, you say it's for this, but then what are we to say about this other aspect of the blame praise system where it doesn't seem like it's for that? And that, that would be the, it's the kind of method you'd use, but it's got a different target here. Um, and then let's see. Uh, oh, why can't, why, why, why am I not engaged in fancy dancing? Well, it's gonna, it goes to that previous answer which is that there's something else going on. It's, this project is in, importantly orthogonal to the constitutivist project. And it's, but it's driven by the fact that it looks like there are these, you know, prima facie counter examples in all of the constitutivist cases where the right answer is probably that disjunctive list, but then I've lost interest. And now my interest has turned to, okay, what's, why are these things on the list and not other things and what's, and the best way to address that is to ask, what is this for? And once you do that, then I think that you're now open to certain kinds of explanations that are available to you know, those who are working in science and social science and so forth, so that um, you can appeal to the sperm case, for example, and say, you know, not every <laughs> sperm is for fertilizing eggs, but very, very, very few are able to um, uh, meet that functional demand, but that's what it's for. That's what explains what's there. And so the fact that there may be lots of cases that don't fit or don't seem on their face to be meeting the functional demand are in fact uh, explained properly still by appeal to that function. So I hope that addressed the main concerns, not satisfactorily, of course, but best I can do here. All right, Eddie, you're up. Uh, thanks, Dave. That was great. Um, I, I guess the the easiest way to put the question is, can you just say a little bit more about why your view would be better than a communicative view, not necessarily one of the existing accounts uh, from, from Frick or McNamara that have, you know, specific issues that you might think require fancy dancing, but 
it sounds like your account is aimed at understanding the functions of blame and praise in the system of norm maintenance. And I would think for that function to be satisfied best, the, the goal of the signaling is going to be to uh, have the right effects on hearers, the community or the individual you're praising or blaming, or even yourself if you're self-blaming. And so to me, that just sounds like it's the communicative function that's doing the, the important functional work. And the signaling is sort of, I mean, costly signaling might complement that as sort of an account of why it's costly and 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 why the signals uh, developed in the way they did. But it still seems like the communicative features more are more essential. And then it might even be that some of the cases that signaling theory seems to handle better might actually be best understood as sort of spandrels of communicative functioning, right? They're just sort of, you know, the cases where there isn't a hearer, but you still do it just because we developed this communicative function in order to normally be heard. But in the cases where you're not heard, it's kind of a spandrel. Uh, so anyway, you get the gist of the question. Yeah. Um, and it's not meant to be a challenge to your account. It's really just like, how can we just kind of combine these accounts in the most effective functionalist theory? Yeah, no. I, yeah, I, I take the spirit of the question to be quite fair, and it's one that I like. I mean, the functionalist um, views that I surveyed at the end are, you know, I take them to be, we're on the same team. Um, and maybe with the exception of protest, because that is harder to fit into the blame praise system, I think there are versions that are available for people to put together a kind of affective view or a kind of uh, communicative view. Uh, and I, my my heart's closest to the communicative people, and so I you know I I I think that's great. I mean, let's work together here and let's figure out the best way to explain what's going on here. And you might be you might well be right that uh, communication is the core feature here, and that the other aspects are these kind of predictable upshots, but not part of the core functional explanation. And I'm open to that. Um, the main aim here is to say I think is to motivate the turn away from the constitutive focus to the, the make the functionalist turn, as a few of us were saying a few weeks ago at, in No War. And so, yeah, I, I, I'm just in agreement with you on that. And I, I welcome that possibility. You're also right to point out the current accounts don't do that, but I think it's open for people to expand them in the appropriate sorts of ways. I mean, one of the main aims today is try to get you on board with the, the right target being the blame praise system. The whole it includes praise, and I think part of our problem has been that we've been focused exclusively on blame. I mean, it's sexier, it hurts, it's more fun to write about. But I think we have to include the praise stuff. And once you do that, that that has to motivate a change in the kind of target of functionalist explanations in a way that's possible, surely, but it hasn't been done yet. Thanks, Eddie. Okay, uh, Gus, you're the next in my list. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the maintenance part of norm maintenance. So it seems like a lot of cases, um, even some of the ones that you talked about are cases where what we're doing is creating new norms by blaming and praising people, right? So um, if you look at the early days of COVID, when you praise somebody at the supermarket for wearing a mask, or when you give somebody an angry look for not wearing a mask, um, you might think that what's happening there is we're trying to change or create new norms, right? Um, we're not maintaining existing norms already. Um, same thing, like if you look at, you know, people blaming celebrities on Twitter in the early days of the Me Too movement, um, like what's happening there is people trying to change norms, not just maintain them. So I'm wondering if you can account for that within the norm maintenance uh, view that you have, or if you just have a broader idea of what maintenance is than, than what I was thinking. Yeah, no, that's great, because I, I'm open to the possibility there, although I think I can reinterpret, reinterpret your cases. So that they are maintenance of norms. I mean, people were blaming people the early stages of COVID because they thought that they were being disrespectful. And disrespect has always been something that we're trying to, um, or respect is always something that we're trying to enforce. And the same thing might be true in the two cases. I think humor is the best thing at creating new norms. But at any rate, um, but I'm open to the possibility 
that um, it may be a bit broader than norm maintenance, that um, some of what we do in blame and it's may go towards the tweaking or expansion of the normative system. And if you can get enough people on your side, that's the problem. You get enough people on your side to engage in blaming for the same activities, then maybe you can create a certain kind of norm. But that's really hard to do unless you're a kind of moral exemplar. This is stuff that Bicchieri talks explicitly about. I mean, getting norms to change is really, really tough. Um, but I'm open to that possibility. I just, I, I think that this system is, 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 is a more conservative system than that. Now, that's not, to, none of this is to say that any of this is not to be changed. <laughs> there can be normative pressures external to the system that are relevant here. Uh, but how you do so, I'm not sure it's done within the blame praise system in the way that you're suggesting. But again, maybe it is, and that would be a kind of cool addition here. Thanks, Gus. Okay, uh, Randy. Uh, Dave, yeah, that was a really rich talk. I have lots of questions. Um, I'll try to, let's see, I'll, I'll limit myself to just a couple. So one thing that struck me in your response to Greg, um, so it, um, it, it seems that, you know, some of the theories that you initially start talking about is, uh, well, I, 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 I took it you were taking them to be so competing theories uh, of your target um, that um, actually they've got a different target. Uh, part of your complaint is they've got the wrong target. Um, so, so um, I mean, some of these folks, what they're trying to characterize is which, which attitudes that we have are blaming attitudes, um, but that's not your target. Um, your, your target is, well, it includes praise as well as blame, and it, it's not limited to attitudes. It's um, sort of a, um, a behavior and and attitudes. Um, so, I mean, one thing that struck me is, um, you know, the uh, many of your objections, they're not objections to theories that purport uh, to, um, uh, to be that that have the same target as your theory, so mm -hmm. you know, that, that that seemed um, uh, a bit odd, um, and, and you know maybe the, the uh, so I, I guess part of your objection is you know that's that's not a good target to have, or um, but uh, anyway, I'm I'm kind of skeptical. I, I I tend to think well, there are lots of good philosophical questions. Um, and the one that you've asked is a really interesting one. Um, but it seems to me that the, a quite different question that some of these other theorists are asking, or, or, quite, or quite different questions, well, they're good, they're good questions to ask too. Um, I, I, I thought at one point in response to Greg, you said, well, they're, they're asking, you know, what's common to all instances of, instances of blame or more broadly, you know, uh, one might ask what's what's common to all instances of blame and, and what's common to all instances of praise. But you're asking what is what are blame and praise for? Um, so in, in effect, you're, you, you've changed the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you, I guess it seems like you, you're not even offering an answer to the question that they're asking. Um, okay, anyway, so that's, that, uh, am I right about that? I didn't, yeah, that's the question. Um, the the other thing is, um, so I guess you know, in in asking, you know, offering your answer to what is blame for, it sounds like that's an empirical hypothesis. Um, um, if you know somebody asks, well, what's the heart for, and, and they say, well, it's to pump blood. You know, well, yeah, that we can find yeah, that seems an empirical claim, and we could ask for evidence for it, and we've got good evidence for it. But I didn't. I mean. It, it seems like you've given a kind of armchair <laughs> um, speculative answer, uh, but you know it would be you know uh, uh, a big job to come up with uh, evidence to support the, the hypothesis. It's a plausible story, yeah, but it seems I mean, is it more than that? Okay, that's the second question. 
All right, great. Thanks, Randy. Or no thanks. Um, <laughs> so, yes, there's a sense in which I'm just saying, I'm answering a different question here. Um, that what the constitutivists are after is just a, something different. But one of the points here is to try to tell a developmental story of why we should end up with trying to answer the functionalist question. And that's because of the fancy dancing story, that there's something about that particular approach when it comes to blame or praise, that, or, or, or when it comes just to blame, that's what they're about, that there are these prima facie counterexamples to all of them, and they're working in the prime, they're, they're working in the counterexample business. That's how they're typically offered these theories. And so these are fair criticisms that to patch them up requires uh, them to appeal to things that seem to contravene the spirit of the original um, theory. I didn't go into all of that, but I, th th I, there's a story that can be told there as well. But the main aim of that is of listing all of that and going through that is just to say, um, it seems to me that you get what you want from the constitutive, a, a, a constitutivist account by going disjunctive and you're listing all the properties. That seems to me to be the leading way, the best way to respond to the charges of the fancy dancing or the prima facie counterexample move is to be more inclusive, to move away from the monism and go pluralist. But once you do that and you've got this list of properties, then I was thinking that this, uh, now it does, it seems less like a theory that we were interested in. Um, and just seems like a list of properties where now I'm wondering why are these properties on the list and not some others and where we wind up dialectically from that, from all of those moves is to ask the different question. We do in fact have a pretty recognizable system. What's it for? And so to make the functionalist turn is to turn away basically from the constitutivist focus because it turns out that that when it, is at its most plausible, which I think is the disjunctive list, seems much less interesting than we thought it was going to be. So that's what motivates the functionalist turn. That's why I'm, ans I'm asking a different question. And so I don't deny, as you suggest, I don't deny that there's really, there could be really interesting, there could be interesting stuff that you can do, you could pursue in, in exploring the attitudinal um, nature of blame and so forth and so on. Uh, I think it's going to go more towards questions of fittingness, aptness, as opposed to what the thing is, but that's a totally separate talk. Um, so it's just to say, here's the explanation for why I think this is the question that we ought to be asking. So there's a normative aspect to the functional turn. With regard to the second question, um, that this is in a way an empirical claim. And so uh, given that I'm, my answer is armchairish, um, uh, what's the evidence for this kind of claim? Um, and I think that um, what I'm doing is suggesting that there's a machinery available for, if we go functionalist, there's a machinery available here that seems to fit really well with the evidence, with the actual phenomenon, sorry, with the actual phenomenon of the blame praise system. And that, um, uh, can deal with all of these cases, can explain pretty well all of these cases that are in the blame praise system, the self blame stuff, the private blame, the counterfactual blame and so forth. So it can provide a really good explanatory story. That of course means that there's plenty of empirical work that could be done here and has been done. And there's some empirical work that I'm appealing to that I just haven't brought to the fore in this talk. Um, so I agree with you that it's an empirical project in a sense, uh, but the story I'm telling today is why, as an explanation, the machinery that's available to us is a pretty powerful set of expl explanatory tools that's going to take us a long way to understanding the, the answer to the question, what's, what's this stuff for? I know none of this is satisfactory to you, but I'd be happy to follow up later. I'm satisfied. <laughs> no, you're not. I know you too well. <laughs> like you said, it's hard to fake these things, Dave. Um, Jeffrey.
you're up. Hi, thanks, Dave. Um, I just sort of, again, want to go back to your criticism of the constitutivist views. So it seems like what's motivating your rejection of them is either it's going to be either that these each of these views is going to have this problem with false positives or false negatives, or they can fix them, but they become boring and sort of meaningless in doing so. Um, or they just lack whatever they were supposed to be doing, what they were doing. But I guess I have a little bit of a hard time seeing it with the first part of that, which is how the costly signaling theory doesn't yield the same verdicts. So I, maybe you've been asked this before, I have a feeling you have, but the Sister Helen case, it looks mm -hmm. to me like on the costly signaling theory, or I, I guess I'm just asking if you could say a little bit more about why Sister Helen doesn't yield the same verdict on the costly signaling theory as it does on the moral protest theory and what's sort of different about this? Yeah, good. So um, what I think about the Sister Helen K, well, so I'm gonna draw my answer almost entirely from um, remarks that Manuel and I make at the end of our paper. And it's that, um, does the example of Sister Helen count as blame uh, or, it, uh, or not? And our response is, who cares? Now, you, you may take this to be completely unfair, <laughs> but I'm playing different games in the first part of the talk than I am at the in the last part. So what I'm trying to draw attention to is this social phenomenon. And... Once you see it, you can't unsee it because you see, ah, yeah, yeah, of course, we're doing this all the time. And so we are signaling our commitment to various kinds of norms. And we can do this in a variety of ways. Um, sometimes, uh oh, dog is coming in because it's dinner time. Um, and sometimes these are uh, uh, costly, sometimes they're not. Um, and sometimes they're educative, uh, sometimes they're merely corrective. But once you see the this social phenomenon, which is gonna, where the blame and praise is gonna overlap with these other things that also contribute to this kind of function, you're gonna have multiple pools that perform the same function. The classic case is forks and chopsticks are both for getting food to your mouth. Um, so that's no complaint against the, the signaling theory. Does it count as blame? Eh. Who cares? Yes, there's a kind of signaling that's going on here and it's signaling her commitment to a set of norms. Um, whether it's blame or not, I am no longer terribly interested in. Again, that may seem like a cheat or seem unfair given the earlier part of the dialectic, but the earlier dialectic part of the dialectic I'm playing, I'm trying to play on the same, with the, uh, with the same rules as the constitutivists are. But when you go to the functionalist account, it's not that all rules are off, but there's a different set of rules that are in play here. And once the attention is drawn to the phenomenon, then you say, OK, whether or not it counts as this thing, that's less important than whether or not it, too, might contribute to this, play this functional role for society. I hope that was clear. Thanks, Jeff. There wasn't. Even. OK, so now you have to reveal the name name. <sighs> this is Andreas. Oh my God, <laughs> it's been a while. It has been. Thanks for, uh, thanks for, uh, yeah. Uh, so I have a kind of a big picture question and, and, and it's basically this. So so how does, what is it to be blameworthy on, on if we accept your kind of descriptive view of what, of what blame is, right? Because there's a debate, right, whether we should understand blameworthiness in terms of pitiness or desert um, or forward-looking considerations. And many people think that how we answer that question will depend on what blame is, right? If blame is just an attitude, just an emotion, then perhaps we go for fittingness. If it's sanctioned, then perhaps we go for desert. But now you have this picture where, like, there's so many things that are blame, right? Uh, so it's sanctions, it's attitudes, but it's also behavioral modifications, mo modifications of relationships, and etc. So 
So I'm just um, curious how, 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 whether you, you have created a unified uh, picture on the level of, um, of blame, but, but will it just split up uh, on the level of blameworthiness and we get an extremely complicated picture on, on that level? Or is there room for unification there as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think uh, your, your, your worry that we're going to get a fractured understanding of blameworthiness is my joy. I mean, I think that's the, <laughs> I think that's the right kind of that's the right kind of conclusion. There's nothing on this account that says anything about worthiness for blame. But you're right that I've got that list of the things that fall under the rubric of this system. Um, in the talk I gave a few weeks ago, the idea was that I wanted to, I highlighted about six or seven of those features within the system. I had the same slide, but highlight the ones that deliver pain or sting or hurt. And those are the kinds of things that people typically say call for talk of justification, whether that be dessert or fittingness, maybe something else, certainly requires some kind of moral justification. So what this, what this view would do would say, these are all the things that count here. And what you're going to want to focus on are the things that people have typically thought require some kind of moral justification grounded in fairness or justice, maybe dessert or fit. And so you point to those specific things now, and it matters less to me whether or not you've identified the blameworthy uh, than that you've identified the things that require moral justification, which is really the question that people who are exploring this like you are, are interested in. So, I, but, so the, the upshot would be that we're not gonna have a unified account of blameworthiness, full stop, praiseworthiness, full stop. In fact, one of the aims of the book that I'm working on is to say that it's, there, there are lots of things going on here. There are multiple distinctions here. You can tell a symmetrical story between blame and praise, but it's incredibly complicated. And the traditional questions that we've had are only going to apply to some subset. Thanks, Andres. Okay, so I guess I, I'll have maybe two questions. The one is motivated by what, what, um, what he just said, and then the other maybe is a little bit more uh, involved. But... I, I take it the reason you don't say anything about blameworthiness is because you're neutral with respect to the norms. The norms could be terrible. So mm -hmm. segregation was awful, but you you blame people who are eating at the same table or let them have let, let them have access to the restaurant or the bathrooms. So lots of blaming for maintaining norms that are terrible. But you would say that none of the people being blamed were blameworthy. That's the weirdness. I mean, yeah. I take it that's why when they come apart, it seems so, somehow they need to reconnect. And I don't know what I don't know what the getting the blame worthiness back in the project looks like. But that was just a background. I, I had that question sort of early, um, and then what what he said made me think about it again. But that's the the broader thing I wanted to ask is it seems like the main assumption and the way that you sort of the, the move is to say, well, look, here are all these views of blame, these constitutive views of blame, but they they can't. It looks like we want something that gives an account of like play, praise and blame, and they can't do that. And this, therefore, mm -hmm. that's the, but it's it's only because you're treating it as like a praise blame system. So of course, if I say it's a praise blame system, then all the views that don't focus on praise will by definition be inadequate. But there are all sorts of differences in praise and blame. The logic is different. Uh, the, the underlying emotions are different. The attitudes are different. The way we respond is different. Different neural circuitry is involved. It looks like these are things that probably evolved at different periods of time. We find things that look like blame and primates and monkeys and other complex social creatures. It's harder to see what praise looks like. So praise is a little weirder. Um, and so it, it looks like they come apart. And the social psychology of praise and blame, you have these asymmetries. Like people don't view they don't treat praise and blame as if they're just two parts of the same, two sides of the same coin, because they come apart in, in various ways in terms of like praise and blame attribution. And then this might speak to a little bit of the stuff that Sean does, but like, so take uh, psychopaths as like a good example. And you've written about, about psychopaths. Like that's a, that's a group of individuals that are like very sensitive to praise. And indeed, like the only way that we've found that you can rehabilitate them is if you catch them early on, and you design purely positive reinforcement contingencies for them, right? They're just, they're insensitive to blame. And so like even the praise and blame comes apart and we can tell a story about why they're sensitive to praise, but not blame. And we can tell it in terms of the circuitry. And all. We, we, so we have a empirical psychological story to tell, but then I, I guess the point is then why, why not just say you have norms and then there's like a praising system 
and it has one set of operations and there's a blaming system. It has another set of operations. There's not a praise blame system. There's a system of norms, some of which are best suited for like a praise approach and then the other a blame approach. And then it's not going to be a system of praise blame. It's going to be a norm, a system of norms. Um, and then praise plays some role in some contexts, but not others. And blame plays another one, but they're not like two parts of the same thing. I don't know if that made any sense, but that's, that was. Yeah, my, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's a perfect setup for me, Thomas, because this question is what motivated the book, The Architecture of Blame and Praise. Um, it was that there seemed to be all of these asymmetries between blame and praise. But philosophers who are writing about responsibility often appeal to this motto that uh, to be a responsible agent is just to be uh, someone who is uh, susceptible to various responses like blame and praise. Yeah. And they use the phrase all the time, but they only talk about blame. Hardly anybody, hardly any philosophers until very recently have talked about praise. And then you've got the social psychologists who have talked about praise, and they found to be these serious asymmetries between blame and praise. So that's where, it's, that's where the book starts. And the aim is to show that, in fact, there is, an, a, there is a space symmetry between blame and praise. It's much more complicated than we've thought. We get there by thinking about cases of narcissism and psychopathy. Um, and it turns out that there are just distinctions between types of blame and types of praise. But overall, the aim here is to show that it's about norm maintenance. And then within that system, there are, and this just goes to your first question and to Andreas's question again, and maybe a bit to Greg's, that um, this doesn't say anything about the aptness of blame or praise. Um, and then you're exactly right that blame can attach to all sorts of toxic norms and does. Um, so there's no normative bit going on there yet. Let's just try to understand the general structure. It turns out the general st structure is symmetrical, I think. And it's symmetrical in part because it's a contribution to this social organism that we've got. And it contributes in a variety of ways. Both blame and praise have backward looking examples and forward looking examples. They've got um, uh, demanding versions, and they've got non-demanding versions, which I think of blame as mockery. So I say a lot about that in, in the book. It's trying to develop mockery as a kind of blame. And but once once we see, we have to start with this just huge amount of responses. They look like on their face there's genuine asymmetries between them. It turns out that there's not. We can explain it away by uh, filling in various gaps that have not been noticed before. That's supported by the empirical literature. That's revealed to us in part by thinking about these kinds of impairment cases like of psychopaths and narcissists and so forth. So this is just too big for me to say you know, what, what the exact answer is here, but I'm totally moved by the exact things that move you. That's what motivates the attempt to explore in detail the nature of this stuff. And I think I've got us, there is a system here and it's organized and it's symmetrical and that's like a huge payoff, I think. Well, look at me giving you the giving you the kind of question you wanted to end on. Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, does anyone any other questions? Anyone else? Dave, like I always, I appreciate all the speakers' times. You you, you guys are doing this for free for us, so I, I greatly appreciate it. So it was great. Um, I'd be happy for to free. See Hold on a second, Tom. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> it's too late now. <laughs> the, the, the process was its own reward, Dave. <laughs> But anyway, Thanks so yeah, so thank, thank you very much for, uh, for for your time. Thanks to everybody else for showing up. Thank you very much, everybody. This is incredibly helpful. And then the last thing, if you like I said, if you want to be on the email list, if you're not on social media, that's the only other way I announce these things. Um, just send me an email and I'll be happy to add you to the list. So in the future, you, you're on that. So you get them. Um, if you have suggestions, I'm always looking for suggestions for new people to invite. I mean, I, I like I'm trying to I'm sort of committed to trying to have four talks a year. Um, and so I'm already thinking about next year. And if you're if you're someone who wants to give one of those talks, I'd be happy to talk to you about that, too. So I'm open to to considering lots of different possibilities. Um, otherwise, I uh, hope everyone has a good night. Uh, thanks for showing up. And uh, and I'll see you hopefully next spring. Everyone have a good end of the term and good winter break. Thanks, Thomas. Sure. Have a good night.